Well, I have um, two stories about Lord Beaverbrook uh, when I met him one-on-one. -on -one. The first story uh, takes place in London. It was shortly after I arrived in London in September of uh, 1951. I was a Beaverbrook Overseas Scholar, and uh, shortly after we all of us arrived in London, uh, Lord Beaverbrook invited us to a cocktail party at the Savoy Hotel. I was thrilled to pieces to be invited to the Savoy because I'd read about it so many times in uh, my lifetime of reading, and uh, I was so thrilled to be invited there. One and only time I was ever in the Savoy Hotel in London. And uh, when I arrived, Lord Beaverbrook was there. It was a, a cocktail party. And he was there, and he greeted me by name. He said, hello, Miss Warren. Uh, he said, uh, there's someone here that I want you to meet. So he took me uh, over to a, a young woman, probably a little bit younger than I am, and her name was Weta McClellan. And he said, you and Weta both come from Moncton, so I thought you should know each other. And uh, I was amazed that he would, A, he would know my name, and B, he would know I came from Moncton. But anyway, he introduced me to Weta. Weta was um, one of, was a, a social reporter for the Evening Standard. She had apparently uh, met Lord Beaverbrook in New Brunswick earlier and uh, told him that she wanted to work for his newspaper, and he said, finish your schooling and come and see me. <laughs> and so she, with that slim invitation, she went over to London and went to see him in his office, and he gave her the job of being the uh, social reporter for the Evening Standard. Now, I could go on about Weta, but I think perhaps I'll tell you now that my second story takes place in Fredericton, and it was, uh, Somewhere in the mid-50s, probably about 54, 55, 56, somewhere along there, I was at that time uh, the president of the faculty club. The faculty club is now defunct, but uh, I was the first woman to be president of the faculty club. Bill Smith was the president for two years, and then I was the president. And when I was the president of the faculty club, I said to the group, the faculty, you know, Lord Beaverbrook has entertained us so many times. Every time he comes to Fredericton, he gives us a cocktail party or a dinner or something. And I said, I think it's time we did something for him. And they all agreed. So we decided we'd have a, a cocktail party at the Lord Beaverbrook Hotel in the mezzanine. And so I sent him an invitation, five to seven. And I knew that at five o'clock he would be there. He was very prompt. And uh, so uh, uh, everything was all ready in the mezzanine. And uh, um, a f my friend, Bev McCauley, came along and said, was there anything he could do for me? And I said, yes, you can go downstairs and meet Lord Beaverbrook and bring him up to the mezzanine. And so he did that. And, and uh, as Lord Beaverbrook came in, he had his man with him, and there was a little boy at the door selling Navy League tags. And uh, Lord Beaverbrook looked at him, and well, well, he, the little boy wanted money. Lord Beaverbrook apparently didn't have any money with him. So he said to this little boy, what did you do with those instruments that I gave you? <laughs> the little boy was very upset, <laughs> very confused. Anyway, my uh, friend, uh, Bev McCauley, brought, me, brought him upstairs, and he and I stood in the middle of the mezzanine, and as, as the members of the faculty came and their spouses, I introduced them all to him. And at that time, I'd reviewed some. I didn't know some of the wives' names before, but I studied them up, and I knew every, when I introduced them, I knew every uh, wife or, or, and husband and, uh, the, on the faculty. And so we, that, we did that for quite a long time, and he had a word with each one. And then he said to me, now, Miss Warren, let's go over to the bar. So we went over to the bar, and I had planned that um, we would have one bottle of Johnny Walker Black Label. I'd been told that was what Lord Beaverbrook liked to drink. 
but it was very expensive. So I told the barman, only one bottle and keep it hidden until Lord Riverbrook comes to the bar. So when we got to the bar, the barman uh, filled up a huge glass, about five or six inches tall, with uh, this beautiful whiskey and that for Lord Riverbrook. And he just took his hand and pushed it gently over towards me. There you go, Miss Warren, he said. And so I took the glass and took a few sips, but I, then I found a fern or something to hide it behind, so I, I couldn't drink all of that. But anyway, that's my story of Lord Beaverbrook. Very kind man. Can you speak to how he <coughs> impacted your life? Big pardon? Can you speak to how he impacted your life? Impacted my life. Well, of course, getting a, an overseas scholarship was uh, wonderful because I um, it was supposed to be um, uh, I was supposed to be a student at the University of London Queen Mary College which was in the east end of London the Mile End Road which had been badly damaged during the war and uh, actually Queen Mary College uh, was really not uh, well the library was okay but the biology department where I was scheduled to work was was uh, was just being rebuilt, so there wasn't much I could do. But I had a wonderful time. After I'd been there a few days, I decided that there was no use trying to work when there was a laboratory with nothing in it, not even a Bunsen burner. They were still working on re replacing it after the war. So I decided I would study London instead. So I used to read up on London in the evening. And the next day, I'd go and visit cathedrals and art galleries, and oh, I had a wonderful time. So that was that was a terrific gift, you know, to a whole year of uh, the after. Well, in June, by June, uh, I I went on holidays. Not that I wasn't on holidays before, but I planned a trip all around uh, uh, the southern sorry, down in southwest England went up to Wales, over to the Lake District, up to Scotland, and I met different, I arranged to meet different friends at different spots. And uh, then I was about two months on this tour of, uh, of Scotland, Wales, and England. And finally, uh, I ended up in Liverpool on, for, to uh, uh, be, come back home again in September of 1951. So I had a wonderful, he, he really, uh, you know, helped me to travel and to see, uh, uh, study uh, the British Isles very, very well. He didn't want anybody to go, any of his scholars to go to Europe, and uh, I mean, continental Europe. So, you know, I had a, I, there was lots I could do in England, Scotland, and Wales. I have very happy memories of all those visits. Then, of course, here in Fredericton, um, when I met him here, he, he was always very kind to me. And uh, I, I thought he was a, a very fine person. And I met his family, too, when uh, he came, uh, Sir Max and, uh, and uh, Lady Vi and uh, some of the children. So it was, it was a great thing to to know him. What, what would be uh, something that you would want future scholars to, or scholars to kind of remember about him? Is there one thing that you think is really important? Well, I think his generosity, probably, because he was so generous. You know, so many, he started his Beaverbrook scholarships in 1920. And, uh, you know, he went on until he died in the 60s. And so many people uh, received them. I remember Florence Snardgrass, who was my friend and a teacher. She was, I think, the first uh, full professor, first woman full professor at, uh, at UNB. And uh, she had one of the 1920 scholarships. And it made a big difference in her life. She was able to... Uh, come to university, and later on she went to Yale, 
and got a PhD and became a full professor and, you know, meant a great deal to her and uh, as it did to all of us, all of us Beaverbrook scholars. So, um, we, you know, we, his generosity was without limit, it seemed to me. And um, he was just a very, very nice, general, generous, kind, thoughtful man, I thought. I, I, know I had a feeling when I was in London, actually, that a lot of the English people didn't think very much of him. I don't know why that was, but I stood up for him. <laughs> now, when was it the, um, we formed the, the Beaverbrook uh, um, Scholars Group? Um, I don't know whether we were a society, but I remember um, uh, Arnie McAllister, uh, who was uh, the, uh, I think he was the uh, f professor of um, geology. He asked me if he, if I would uh, make a list of the Beaverbrook scholars, because there were Beaverbrook scholars from UNB, but there were also scholars at, uh, in Nova Scotia. And um, for instance, that when, we went, when I went overseas on my Beaverbrook scholarship in 1950, there were at least two girls that I knew, both called Ruth, from Mount Allison, and there were, so, and there were some from at University of London, I think, University of Western Ontario in London, Ontario. <clears throat> so, um, uh, um, there were, I think, uh, Ar when Arnie asked me to uh, uh, make this list, there was a vote then that they decided to uh, 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 form a group that and our motto was uh, to do for others what's been done for us. And that was when we set up the, the Lord Beaverbrook Students Award that we give now. We still give it. It's up to about $10,000 a year, I think, now. And we meet every, we have a, an official meeting every year in November, and I think it's a Saturday coming up. And uh, we uh, always, renew that scholarship and talk about the various students that we've helped. Many now, I think that's, I, I'm not sure just when that started, in the 40s sometime, I think. The first person was uh, Leanne Smith. So lots of young women and lots of young men have won those over the years. Keep, keeps his name alive and we like to that, you know, those of us who were early scholars are very happy to be helping the scholars now in our turn, doing unto others what was done for us. <laughs>